Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast, where we have inspiring conversations with amazing individuals from all around the world and look for ways to create a clean, green and sustainable planet, us and all other beings. I'm your host, Tom Simak, an athlete and fellow plant eater who strives to optimize every living ecosystem. Passionate about looking after this beautiful floating rock we call home and all the lovely creatures that dwell among it. Today, we are speaking with Bill Muir, AKA Sergeant Vegan. As the name suggests, Bill is a combat veteran. He's also a registered nurse and speaker. Bill is someone who has a very unique story to say the least. He's been plant-based since 1992, that's crazy. He's gone through war zones and army training eating exclusively plants. I love Bill's overall confidence and demeanor. Amongst the societal belief that veganism is for feminine individuals, um, which is a guy I I definitely see that still kind of, I guess, being proliferant in the world. Bill literally takes this concept and throws it out the window. I think everyone will take a little bit out of this episode, but I hope in particular the men listening Uh, can really extinguish any belief left in them that they are feminine because they don't eat animal flesh, um, which is absolutely not the case. This conversation will have us talking about the battlefield, his experience in the army, following your ethics, and being a militant activist. And if that is even the right way to go about things. There is a language warning on this one. Um, I always like to tell my guests to be as natural as as they want to be and if swearing is part of that then so be it a filter is definitely not necessary in life and nor should it be in this podcast and you can have a safe assumption that a lot of these episodes and conversations are recorded via zoom and our conversation was actually cut in the middle through a technical difficulty so i hope that the flow was picked up on the second half and you may not even notice it but for those who do um, please excuse the technical issue With that being said, I hope you enjoy this conversation and I'll see you on the other side. Bill, Sergeant Vegan, welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast. How are you going? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm doing awesome. You know, Bill, when I was looking through your Instagram, I I thought of something interesting. You've been vegan from my calculations for 29 years now. And a lot of what I see you post is this like, like this vegan in quotes junk food, like the the donuts, the the new cream is that we have, and all this amazing new innovation that's coming out. I can only imagine how much of that you're eating now to make up for lost time. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because this coffee has that creamer that you're referring to. That like did the not almond and coconut that. one. It's exa- That's exactly what it is from a place we have here, Trader Joe's. That's exactly what's in this this coffee right as we speak. You know what? I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent. What does creamer taste like? I have no clue. You, uh, do you drink coffee? Yeah, I do. You drink you don't have it with creamer? It's not like it's not like milk? Is that what it is? It's like a thick milky like substance. So, for the longest time and I would say approximately, well, almost 30 years, I did not drink uh, creamer in my coffee because it, it wasn't a, it wa- there wasn't a vegan a- version available a b if there was when i was in the military there wasn't a vegan version available period and then uh and see like now that i'm able to drink it it you know it is a luxury it's completely unnecessary i have a frother i'll froth it up so it it takes like something out of like a starbucksy kind of place you know, uh, the Japanese will call it a luxury zaitaku, uh, and it is a very zaitaku kind of thing. But, uh, you know, is it necessary? No, but does it make my day like 0.1% better? I suppose so. Um, I love it. And you mentioned something interesting before and in saying that you were in the military and you were also in the military as a vegan. And that's a big part of the story. And it's what you go to talk about a lot because... I think, and it might be something we touch on today's conversation in that, and I'm sure you'll agree for a long time, and maybe it's it's stopping a little bit, but still, you know, a concept in some philosophies that veganism is hippie and, and seeing someone who's in the military, almost like, oh, you know, a man's man, um, you know, eating plants, that's very 
I'd say unique. So do you want to give us a quick rundown of, of your story and maybe, you know, what makes you, what made you go vegan initially and maybe your experience in the military to, to where you are now and the lessons you've taken away from that? Okay. Um, so I went, maybe go back vegetarian. Uh, I went vegetarian first year of college slash university as kind of a kind of a, a snarky, goofy punk rock thing to do. It was not popular as you could guess because this was like 1990, 1991 where I started toying it with it and 1992 where I pulled the trigger on it. Um, my parents in the uh, right around Lent of 92 asked me uh, what I was going to give up for Lent. And Lent is this 40 days before Easter in the, I think it's mostly Catholic tradition, where you're supposed to give up something and it makes Jesus happy. Uh, not to be blasphemous, but I suppose that's what it's supposed to be. So my mom, who's very, very Catholic, was started asking me, what am I going to give up? And just out of nowhere, I I grabbed that idea. I said, hey, uh, you guys don't eat meat on Fridays for 40 days. I'm not going to eat meat at all for Lent. And people's minds exploded. It was like I told them that the, you know, the world was flat or some kind of like crazy thing, something that went against all science and all reason. And I didn't even say I'm going vegan. Though A, I didn't even know what the word was at that point. And B, uh, you know, I just said I was going regular vegetarian and people just thought it was nuts. Fast forward through Lent, I did not die. I still wasn't doing it for any conscious reason other than just to do it, just to see. I didn't know any other vegetarians or vegans and people thought it was nuts. People thought that I was gonna die. People said that it was crazy and I felt pretty good. And so when my mom and, and dad and friends asked me, hey, are you gonna start eating meat again? Like sh somehow you survived Lent, you're not dead. Uh, are you gonna you know, get, eat like that emergency piece of pork or something like that. I was like, no, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing and see what happens. And around that time, I, I got a hold of like a pita pamphlet at a punk rock show. And it's sort of talking about how meat is murder. And it started to solidify in my mind that, hey, like uh, I've accidentally did something awesome. Like I'm accidentally not killing animals and that's great. I'm helping the planet because we know, knew even back then, and this is like almost 30 years ago, how awful animal agriculture was for the planet, how exhausting of our resources it was, and how and just how polluting it was. So I thought, yeah, I, I'm doing something awesome. Uh, people asked if I was going to go vegan because a few people knew what that word was by then, and I said, no, like I'm I'm good with just doing this. Fast forward to the summer, I got a hold of a, a PETA pamphlet yet again. Uh, PETA uh, at another punk rock show and I started talking about the dairy industry and at first I tried to close my ears off to that message of dairy and how dairy was rape and how it was connected to the meat industry and I tried to ignore it as much as I could and then one day I just I just had this conversation with myself uh, how much animal cruelty am I okay with if it was zero percent the answer would be vegan and then if it was i'm okay with some cruelty then it would be okay i'm like this that i'm i'm creating different words other than vegan i'm i'm a you know a vegetarian a pescatarian a lacto ovo this whatever and i thought you know what it's a binary choice i'm not okay with animal cruelty that's why i'm doing this i'm doing it at that point consciously to try to make a better world in the very smallest way but at least the only way i knew how and at that point, I was vegan, uh, and that was August of 1992. Fast forward, uh, graduating from university, I moved to Japan, because what do you do if you have a degree in Japanese? I don't know either, except move to Japan. Uh, I was in a punk rock band singing about veganism and stuff like that. Uh, what other kind of exciting things happened while I was there? I, I was on the fun Sergeant Vegan Fact uh, Final Fantasy X soundtrack. I did the theme song to that. Uh, kind of thought maybe that would go somewhere, like maybe I, not a recording career, but my band would stay relevant and I would get deeper into that. And then 9-11 uh, happened. 
And kind of the same thing that drew me to veganism drew me to joining the military. I wanted to do something. I didn't know what it would be. I didn't know how I could help. And I just kind of decided after watching all that awfulness that, you know what, if I joined as a medic, I would be able to help people. I'd be able to bandage up, you know, locals or whoever was hurt and maybe I'd be able to help. And so I sold my stuff, moved back to the States, joined the military. And, uh, and that brings us up to about, uh, 2003 when I went in and, uh, and that's probably, what should I tell you about that experience? It was everything you would think it was good. It was bad. A lot of ugly, um, like I had thought kind of ironically in the beginning of my idea of joining to try to help people, I bandaged more of the locals than I did us. Uh, those poor people just, there's really no entertainment. So uh, local tribes will shoot each other up and, and kids will get hurt all the time. The kids falling into cooking fires and stuff. I spent more of my time doing that. Uh, how was it to be vegan in the military? You're probably asking, I would guess. Uh, you know, it, it depends on what I was doing. When I was in basic training, uh, it was very hard be just because access to food, uh, they made it very difficult to find vegan food, not really intentionally, more just they don't care. Like F you, we don't care kind of kind of thing, which to be fair, you're joining like world's biggest gang. They're not going to care or they're not going to cater to your, your, uh, your lifestyle or something like that, which part of which I, get, I think is fair, part of which I think is not forward thinking because you know, a good percentage of people now are either gluten free or avoiding dairy, or they're not eating meat for religious reasons. So I think they should consider that at least giving people the bare minimum, but I digress. Um, little, little things that people would be curious to, to hear or like, at least think is funny, you know, was the, the food in the dining facilities vegan or vegan friendly? Not really, but like they do have cornflakes. So for breakfast, I would have cornflakes. You know, uh, cornflakes. I'm guessing even, not uh, with soy milk. Yeah. Now they did not have soy milk, but uh, if you were to dress cornflakes up with soy milk and whatever you else would you put on it, you would have a very mediocre, maybe uh, maybe three out of ten meal right there. However, without soy milk, dry, you know, it it's it's a trying, it's a it's a trial right there. And so I would eat that every day for breakfast, just dry cornflakes with water in, in just trying to wash it down. After a while, I started to try to think outside the box. So I started to put fruit cocktail on it, which is, I hope you guys don't have fruit cocktail. Uh, it's not something I've had since the military. It's basically this fruit, I say kind of in quotes in a, in a thick syrup. And I would dump that on the fruit cocktail and I would eat that. Uh, and that doesn't taste good either. Uh, at a certain point, I just gave up on that too. And I just started pouring coffee in there. And that's, that's not great either. Uh, so, but the good news is after, after training, then it was pretty much like a regular nine to five job. So yeah, I, I, I'd be able to get food. I'd be able to go do this, do that. It'd be like a regular job other than uh, working out and getting paid to shoot guns. And, and I mean, that's kind of a, that's as American as you get right there. Uh, then fast forward, I was stationed in Italy vegan food. Have you been to Italy yet? Yeah, absolutely. And I know the vegan food there is on point. It's amazing. So I was like, uh, I was eating like, like it was my job, like a second job. I was eating as much, uh, soy gelato as I could just shovel down my throat pizzas. Like I would eat a pizza for my, for a meal. Yeah. I didn't have you know cheese or anything like that on it. So, and I don't, I'm sure now they have vegan cheese then, then, you know, not so much, but it was still pretty awesome. Uh, and then Afghanistan. Af so funny, I guess, funny anecdote about Afghanistan. So going to Afghanistan, I knew where we were going to first be my unit. So I was like, okay, I knew basic training was awful. I almost starved. I lost probably 25 pounds. It was, was not a great experience. Uh, you know, working out 20 hours a day on, you know, 1500 calories is, is not fun. So I was like, how can I set myself up for success? I came up with it. 
I got these two industrial size boxes and I threw everything that I could find at the commissary, which is like our version of the supermarket in the military. I was like, you know, vegan ramen, cliff bars, uh, shelf stable soy milk. I probably sent myself 150 pounds of food. I was like, I got this. We get in the country, first briefing, they're, you know, blah, 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 the Taliban, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay, doc, uh, bad news. One of your boxes exploded. I'm like, I'm like, my mind is just like, what do I do? And then I go exploded. So A, that was awful news. And B, anytime we got attacked, someone would go exploded with their hands like that, with that kind of goofy look on my face and like exploded. But uh, so yeah, uh, after about a month, I, the real panic started to set in. What am I going to do? The, the food on our forward operating base was basically two Marines opening these big industrial sized tins of stuff and dumping it in like a warmer. There was other than stale bagels, there's re really nothing that w you could say was vegan friendly. And, uh, you know, I got worried. Well, it turned out that the special forces guys on our, on our FOB had set up a very small uh, generator and uh, like internet connection. And for like 20 minutes a day, some people would be able to get on their computer and like write, write a email back home or put something on the internet. And I found out about a site called anysoldier.com, which is where you could kind of like whinge and say that you wanted something or you needed something and people all over the world would be able to see that. And if they were feeling charitable, send stuff to you. Uh, I put that I was vegan and the internet exploded and it was just like, I just started getting packages and packages. It was like a, the heavens opened up and packages started raining down on me. It was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty awesome. And I, w I could say that I almost ate better than the guys who could eat anything and had food just handed to them. Uh, it was pretty cool. And at the height of it, I even got sponsored by Tofurky. And Tofurky was sending me shelf stable Tofurky. Uh, and it was pretty fun. What a incredible journey. And what's really awesome is beyond all this, like this was really a five minute recap on what was months and years of pain, of lessons, of amazing yeah. Tofurky meals potentially. Yeah. And it's just incredible that. You know, I think someone like that is connected to the animals first and foremost would last that much with just dried cornflakes. And, you know, you can just assume not everyone would go through that and they would either cave or just quit the army. And it's awesome that you were dedicated to making a difference. And it kind of spurs to mind a thought. Like, I wonder if initially that conversation with, with Peter in 90 one or 92 gave you the compassion to, to switch that, uh, that switch in your brain to then join the army and have compassion for humans. Cause you know, you can't, we always talk about, you can't be vegan and a Nazi. It just doesn't make sense. It's like you have to embody this overwhelming wholesomeness of compassion, which is something that's really almost difficult, but very rewarding. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I think it's exactly the same thing. Uh, this idea to to do something bigger than yourself, to be able to help the world and make the world a better place. I think it's the exact same thing. And that's why uh, when I talk to people that, you know, put posts like uh, I'm vegan because I love animals, not people. And like this whole concept of being a, uh, basically being a dick to people and that that's going to make people change and make the world a better place. I'm like, you know, like, no, no. And, it, and it's going to make some people uh, angry. And I, I have, a, I've lost, I don't know how many followers, whatever the hell that means, but uh, over the whole vaccine thing, because I'm a nurse, I work in a hospital, I work with COVID patients. Like, like that's how this world I'm hoping uh, when this airs, we'll be already through COVID. But, uh, you know, you can hope in one hand and something in the other, as the old expression goes. Uh, I'm it. sure this is COVID's still going to be around. You know, we people need to wear a mask. People need to protect themselves. But I know plenty of people that, uh, for them, you know, being vegan helps the animals. Anything that's going to help people, they don't care about. So they're not going to wear a mask. 
because uh, it's uncomfortable for them. And just in the same way, I'm saying like, you know, being vegan wasn't something I did for me. It was something I did to make the world a better place. Uh, and I would, I would extend that logic. I mean, you could extend it to anything really. Uh, but, and it's hard to be perfect. Like everybody still gets angry when they drive or, you know, can still get, want to say bad words to their coworker when they are a jerk or, you know, so it's not about trying to be perfect or a perfect person or a perfect vegan, whatever that is, you know, it's just about trying to make the world a little better, doing a little better for the little part of the world that you can control. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a really great segue to something I really wanted to talk about with you. And, and that's just doing the best we can and also having these conversations with people. Because, you know, I think most vegans, I'm definitely, I definitely think not all, but, you know, you've gone through that militant vegan stage. I, I definitely have as well. And I think it's, I think it's fair to be militant when you first go vegan and I don't blame vegans for that feeling. I'm sure you can understand, you know, when you find out about the concept of animal agriculture and the harm it does to potentially, you know, your health, the environment, the animals, you're, you're upset. You're angry. Why have I been, you're angry, not at other people, but why have I not seen this? You know, I think there's an overwhelming sense of self depri deprivation and self deprecation inside you're blaming yourself for the mistakes that you've made and then you lash out on other people why can't you see this i wish i was in your shoes and i saw that straight away and i think you know what is your stance on being militant do you understand where they're coming from are you pro is there a place in the world for being militant i 100 percent understand because i was definitely there um I was as there as, as you could get. There's a, a band that's, I would not say popular, but coming from the punk rock and the hardcore scene specifically is uh, called Earth Crisis. And I was vegan before this band called Earth Crisis. But when I, uh, when I heard them, it really spoke to me. And if, you, if anyone Googles Earth Crisis and goes through lyrics, that's how people like me, especially when I was in my early 20s, felt about the whole vegan movement. Like very, uh, I mean, there's a song called Firestorm, which starts off street by street, block by block, taking it all back. I mean, yikes. They're definitely, you know, super passionate and on fire and, and stuff. Uh, however, my reasoning since I've been doing for this for a minute is what is best going to get people to favorably think of veganism and especially think of eating vegan food as something they can do. And, uh, and earth crisis is not on that list of shit that will change anyone's mind, nor will being a jerk to someone or breaking some stuff or like yelling angry stuff or graffiti. None of that will work. Now, if it did, uh for sure i would i would i would triple down on it i wouldn't just double down i'd say like more we need to we need to throw more stuff at people more uh meet as murder signs you know uh do it uh let's just definitely troll every joe rogan or whatever that does that says something that's not vegan or but i don't think any of that works I, i've never seen it work but what i have seen work is modeling behavior of telling people look this is easy of when someone says vegans aren't this or that say uh well i mean i'm this i'm that you know he's this he's that she's this she's that so uh you know okay next question answering that but not as a not as kind of a jerk would but as someone who's more trying to uh teach instead of preach you know uh, but yeah if militancy worked i would be i would have been you know a gigantic fan yeah, it's definitely the easier route. And what I find <laughs> what I find so fascinating is that transition to becoming more more teaching, less preaching. And that's a very important transition to make. But I wanted to really dive into how you would kind of communicate the concept of veganism, and what, what it really is to you and how you would explain it to some, some people. Because there's people out there I know that haven't heard of the topic or, or have heard of it but thought it's some sort of fairy tale. You know, it's not really a thing. It's a joke that Westerners do or whatever it is. 
how would you, when someone says, what is veganism? What does that even entail? How would you even address that topic? Well, the veganism boils down to is the concept that animals are not here on the planet for us to use, to eat, to kill. They're, they're just other creatures just like us to be here. And, you know, if anything, we should be taking care of them and not killing them and, and creating them into a commodity. The main three reasons that people choose to be vegan are they do it for their health because we've uh, science has shown that eating uh, not eating meat, uh, vegans have a 30% less chance of cardiovascular diseases and there's other cancers and stuff like that. Uh, and then there's for the planet, science has shown, and I'm, we're not talking like very hard to find stuff, but like on CNN, very mainstream science, that animal agriculture is one of the leading causes of greenhouse gases and climate change, which is one of the biggest problems that we have globally right now. And with, that we should all be addressing if we want there to be next generations. And lastly, uh, no matter what your religious tradition, no matter what your, your thought of the, the world, uh, your worldview, killing something for no reason, it, most people agree is wrong. And whether you're a pet person who uh, would do anything to protect their pet, but then would kill a cow, or somebody that would that thinks uh, you know that thinks they love animals and would would never do something awful like kick a dog, but then uh, they're gonna you know randomly pay some someone money to kill this other animal for them. It's just inconsistent and it doesn't make sense. And if you wouldn't personally hunt something or kill something then for you to get, get someone else money to do it, it's kind of weird and kind of weak. And, uh, and kind of along those lines too, if we're, we've just addressed being vegetarian, drinking mi milk and eating eggs from another species is just weird. Like it's not necessary. It's not necessary for survival. And it's just weird. Like if somebody said, yeah, I still drink breast milk at 30, uh, you would look at them weird and if they're if but if they say oh no it's okay it's from a cow people are like oh that's okay that's normal but how is it more normal than if it's from a human woman it's the it's equally weird but i think it's more weird that it's another species and it's uh, and you know it's it's just weird that we've normalized that behavior i mean you can normalize anything look at any awful place or that's existed during time and they've normalized crazy behavior and this eating animals, killing animals for food is a weird, awful behavior that we've normalized. Yeah, I, I agree. There's certain terminologies that I've kind of learned to dance around. When I, you know, I was in that first charter in Melbourne when Anonymous as a Voice have started and I was using terms like, like rape, mutilation, genocide. And while they, I, I agree that they have a place in conversations i've learned to adopt I, I really like the way you actually spoke about that which is just using a bit more of a a human i guess when we talk about veganism as a whole i think it's very confronting like i think mm. talking about the environment and talking about nutrition is much less confronting than talking about the ethics because when you look at like using words like killing and murder it's like that's so vilified and, and rightfully so, you know, when you hear about murderers and killers on the TV, it's about, it's about human animals, not non-human animals. And so associating that term is very difficult and very, it's going to be very hard to accept. And so I wonder what your concept is or philosophy is on, on using sayings such as let's say rape or, or, or genocide and how you kind of dance around that. Do you generally like to use those strong words or do you like to kind of play it down a little bit and just say, it's just weird. Like, just don't do it. I have kind of a non-direct way to answer your question. I think is the, is the actual answer would be know your audience. Like there's some people that are going to answer very well to things that are gonna like tug at their heartstrings or, or like, you know, the kind of people that would like and share that picture of a, a dog and a, you know, a hot car, would you break this window? You know, people are get all amped up. 
oh, okay, and, you know, dog, cow, same thing, killing, whatever. That that kind of conversation, you know, being able to, if you're able to steer it in a way where there where you likened the killing of the dog to the killing of a cow, and are and if you're going to go the uh, dairy scary route, you're going to be able to liken. Uh, you know, dairy milk to drinking breast milk and rape, that might work with some people. However, that's not going to work with everybody. And kind of knowing generally who you're speaking to and talking up the talking points that would work with them, it's not that you're changing veganism, you're changing the approach that would most likely work with people. So me personally, uh, especially as a, you know, 48 year old, you know, I can be super passionate about this and not want to be a jerk to somebody. And I think, I, you know, my style has kind of moved into the, you know, I explain things. I kind of try to tell people generally how I think about it. There's no blame that needs to be put on this, whether you're, you, went, you went vegan yesterday, 50 years ago, or you just eat plant-based. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the real goal in this is getting more people to eat less meat, getting more people to give less money to these companies that are destroying our planet. And also as an activist, I would agree, killing animals and destroying the planet. And if that's the goal, then meeting people where they are and talking to people as people and not kind of like trying to talk down to them and trying to, you know, maybe open up their eyes. Like there's a reason why people's eyes are closed to this. It's not generally that they're jerks, it's mostly that companies have been able to brainwash them watching TV, watching ads. You know, in America, there's this ad or, well, was this ad, you know, beef, real food for real people. This is what men eat. This is what men think, you know, and people ingest that those lies and they embody it. They're like, if I don't drive a truck and have a gun, you know, I'm a, a, a fucking pussy liberal or some shit like that, you know, and I did mm -hmm. the air quotes for people that can't see it. Um, and we have to fight against those stereotypes, not necessarily, I think with words all the time, just, you know, model a different form of behavior, model a different form of living, model a different form of thinking. And I think that can be very important. It's sometimes more important than, uh, than standing on a street corner with that hand jammed meat is murder sign, you know? Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's going to be a little less sexy than, uh, you know, always triggering topics on social media and, uh, you know, it might not be as clickbait worthy, but if we're talking about long game on having people rethink how they're eating, how they're living, I think that's going to be more effective than just inflammatory, confrontational, you know, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, just to touch on the dairy thing, what I found to be really useful, and I think you might agree, is actually, and I think this actually applies to all areas of veganism, which is asking permission to actually tell them how it is, but being human about it. And what I mean by being human about it is, is taking yourself out of the equation or actually becoming more personable. And this is a little bit, it, it's almost... I hate saying it because it's kind of salesy and, and that's saying, you know, when I first, this is for an example, if I were to talk to someone about dairy, when I first found about found out about what the dairy industry does, I was really shocked because actually the terminology that they use is, is these things called rape racks and I, I was so blown away and kind yeah. of kind of using yourself as the cushion because I think for some reason people have this idea that vegans were born vegan. And it's this, it's this strange cultural normality. And I think really taking yourself out of the equation or becoming more personable works in every aspect of veganism or anything you want to talk to. And that also embodies what you were talking about before, which is being compassionate. And actually, I, I think I think you'll really enjoy this, not enjoy this information, but find this really enlightening because this isn't something I'm making up. I'm not being extreme here. This is the terms that they have done. Do you kind of use that approach to different sides as well? Maybe yes and no. I'll, maybe I'll see if it's, if whatever I'm saying would go over well with people. 
If it's not, maybe I'll keep my mouth shut. I mean, it all depends on the situation, who I'm talking to, yeah, right. what I'm talking about. Like, for example, at work, how often do I bring it up? Not very often. I mean, at the same point, I stand in kind of like defiance of a lot of people's like expectations. I'm, I work out almost every day. You know, a lot of my coworkers don't, you know, I've been vegan for X amount of years. So most of my coworkers eat meat, you know, uh, I don't think anybody, um, most people I work with don't smoke. I don't smoke, you know, there's just this like, you know, you can see what they look like. You can see what I look like. Uh, and that, you know, I, so I, when people will ask me about it, I'll explain, explain it and try to explain it in ways that they might get it without being too preachy, uh, you know, versus if I'm at a veg fest or, uh, I'm, I'm speaking, I'll tell people what I think and usually give the non-varnished, uh, no punches pulled approach, but you know, yeah. So I, I see where you would do that. I would, I would think that the, you know, that sales pitch approach would probably work better if you're standing, you know, handing out leaflets and stuff like that. And, mm, yeah. and someone did engage with you. I, I would agree that probably like, you know, kind of asking for their permission or it doesn't even have to be a verbal ask it just to be like, how interested are they? Okay. I'll go into my, you know, sales pitch because you are selling something with, you know, but to be fair, anytime you talk to somebody who has a contradictory, contradictory idea, whether it's about politics or something cultural or, you know, generally this, which is like almost like at the bare root of uh, concepts of human, do you have to kill for no reason? Yes or no. You know, you're selling something and we're, we're selling to the concept that you don't have to kill what you don't have to eat. We don't have to destroy the planet. We don't have to rape animals. You know, most people who actively participate in the dairy industry by, you know, giving them money would be very offended if we called them animal rapers, even though that's exactly mm. what they are, you know, or they're paying money for that, in which case, I don't know that they're both equally bad, but does that necessarily mean that just because we figured out not to do that, we're, we're inherently better. We just, you know, I think uh, it's either Socrates or Pluto or Plato that had that like analogy of the cave and that some, everybody, some people are able to take the blinders off and leave the cave and some people aren't. Uh, philosophy majors, I'm sure will will know exactly what it is. Uh, I learned it and, and dumped most of it a long time ago. But point being, you know, vegans are just people that have been able to, you know, get outside the box. It doesn't necessarily mean that we'd have any kind of moral high ground on people. And I think that's probably something that's held the movement back too. Like, you know, people not wanting to think that, uh, be like talked down to by vegans because we're bad. And then, you know, some vegans acting like they're the savior or something like that, uh, or, you know, stuff like that keeps a boundary between people and stuff like that, I think makes it sometimes harder for people to hear the truth. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's a lot of boundaries and it's hard because I guess you're not, when you become vegan, you've got this information overload. You've learned all these things. And I would almost say in some ways it was easier to talk about veganism in 1995 and around that era because you can you can learn about this topic and this ideology and then just get sucked into the rabbit hole and you go, oh my God, okay, honey, and then what's better, better with fruit and vegetables? Is it organic versus GMO? Is plant-based meat eth effect, uh, ethical? And you can kind of go and wind yourself into this, this looping rabbit hole that's quite anxiety-ridden and can really get you down into the dumps. How do you stop yourself or how would you advise people that they can stop themselves from becoming overloaded with the amount of information that we now have in this information age? That's a very good question. I, I think probably uh, dumbing my life down is the, is the expression that I would use. Uh, I only let so much information and so much worry into my mind at once when I can. 
Um, and it probably came from this, from the whole vegan thing. But I remember as a medic uh, in Afghanistan, all the possible things that could go wrong, all the possible problems that could go wrong. You know, what happens if the dude gets his arm blown? What would I do if they get their leg blown? Uh, it depends on the leg, what part of the leg, the part of the arm while well, he's a tourniquet. You know, uh, what if they get, it, get shot here? What if someone gets burned? Uh, you know, trying to, I'm in, a, in essence, basically, uh, in a way people can understand, if you have too many screens open on your computer at once, you have too many file boxes. And when you do that, the computer starts to run really slow because you're like running too many programs at once. And what I, I, I decided at one point, and it brought me peace, is I said, okay, I'm not gonna worry about, worry about any of shit because there's nothing I can do about it until it actually happens. I'm gonna be as prepared as I can, and I'm gonna take things as they come. And a lot of that's carried over too to as I'm an RN, I, 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 it's not that I wanna know less, it's just that I don't want to know a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't apply to stuff I can help. So it's not that uh, I don't want to get to know a patient, but I'm not going to ask their favorite color. I'm going to do the best I can for the me immediate problems that I got. And uh, I'm not going to worry later about something that if I, oh, I should have done this or should have done that. So I want to touch on something we touched on a little bit ago, and I want to dive into it. When we're talking about being militant, and just to describe it for people who don't really know what we're referencing, we're talking about, like what you mentioned, like, I wouldn't say Anonymous for the Voiceless is militant, but I'd say the way you're... Pro Anonymous for the Voiceless is more educational. I think the militants comes from being very... Uh, I'd almost say I'd associate it with being aggressive. Mm, and Very good way to put it. Yeah. So I think ed educating people with holding up signs is okay. If that sign has an aggressive message, that becomes militant. Something I'm, I've been talking about a lot with my partner these last few months, and it, it's hard. I think there's no yes or no answer unless you have a different insight that could help us um, settle the conversation. I think almost at this stage of my life, I would argue that being militant for whatever reason, whether it's being more clickbaity, so more news articles are publishing more stories, whether it's potentially relating to a certain subgroup of people, I think there is a place for it. I, I think somehow, I think maybe being militant to, to people directly in conversations, I think there's no place for that. I think that's absolutely not productive. But militant actions, as in storming things like SeaWorld um, and just raising that awareness, I think that's a militant protest. Do I think there's a place for that? I think yes, at this stage in our lives. Do you think there is a place or am I missing something? So what, I guess we have a different view of what militant is. So back in the 90s, what we, we would have seen as militant was groups like the ALF, which for those who don't know what it means, it's Animal Liberation Front. So people uh, would basically anonymously attack the uh, the mechanism of animal agriculture, uh, whether it meaning freeing animals, spray painting uh, stuff, breaking windows, smashing locks, whatever, in the way to free animals and in the way to raise awareness, but it usually involved breaking property and the idea was direct action being able to immediately help animals immediately cause damage immediately strike back at at the evil of animal agriculture and other movements for for example earth first had similar ideals uh that's actually what i think of when i think of militant uh, because it has the word obviously military in it. Uh, just being angry and worked up and doing a bunch of angry talking, you know, or like holding a sign, I don't really personally see as militant. It's just a different sales tactic, like whether you're peacefully holding it or angrily holding it or wagging a fist or not. Uh, I think groups like, I don't know, do you guys have a DXE out there? 
We, I, I actually don't know. I don't think we do, but I know of them. Yeah. You're not missing anything if, if you don't. Uh, all apologies to those people because a lot of them are very nice. Uh, their idea is to storm into restaurants or uh, supermarkets and places like that and cause this kind of a cause a ruckus, do a lot of stuff like that to bring people's attention in a spot that that's not really even militant because they're not believing in breaking or smashing anything. It's just causing a scene. Does that help? Maybe. I haven't seen it really personally help, you know, causing that kind of thing, yelling at someone at a restaurant, you're a murderer for eating a steak. You know, is it true? I mean, I, I guess, you know, that's kind of true. Does, does that help? I mean, like, you know, like, I don't know. Uh, I could kind of see where people are coming from doing those things, doing that direct stuff. Like if, if I could port myself back 200 years ago, would I have helped in a revolt if, if uh, somebody was trying to uh, overthrow slavery in the American South? I mean, yeah, that would, I, I could see that. Slavery is like, it's really hard to come up with something that's any eviler than that. You're, it's just awful. Uh, would that have helped in a big picture? I mean, maybe if I got the, you know, if it got things rolling, uh, do, but as far as what we're trying to do is if you heard on the news that some scary vegan terrorist broke some stuff, is that going to make people want to eat less meat? I don't know. I don't think so. And for me, the big picture is what, how people are going to ingest those ideas and what people are going to do with it. And will I be, if I save you know, if we free a, a bunch of mice from a lab, uh, is that going to be big picture be worth all the risk that we're going to entail doing it versus just getting people to not test on animals? You know, so uh, it's also part where you're at with it, how long you've been do, been vegan. And I think to age like, you know, when you're 20, you're angry at fucking everything. Like so, you know, it just conveniently uh, was there for me to be vegan. Uh, and, and I was angry in, in that way. But now that I'm not, not so much angry, but like, like, okay, like, I only have so many hours in the day, what can I do to actually help while holding down like a real job? Uh, and this is the approach. So to be fair to people that are, you know, militant, or are like, no, we need to smash the smash animal agriculture at its, you know, root and Okay, I mean, I could get that, especially, you know, where you are in your life, if you're, you're like 22, you know, and really passionate and angry, you know, like, they're not wrong that animal agriculture is destroying the planet. Animal agriculture is killing billions of, of, of innocent animals every year. It's torturous, awful, it's degrading, it's disgusting, it's everything. My, my argument would be less in how I feel about it and more like what I actually think is practical and what actually works. And we were doing, uh, maybe without me, but people were doing stuff similar to what we're describing in the nineties. And I didn't see a gigantic switch in veganism throughout the world. It really was two things. It was the internet and it was access to vegan food. And those two going back and forth on, on, on one of the, the more people were able to see these products, the more people that bought them, the more other companies were like, hey, we can make some money doing this. And those two things fed off each other to the point where I was listening to, uh, have you heard of Dave Chappelle? Yeah. Yeah, Dave Chappelle is a pretty famous comedian uh, in the States. He has a, he had one punchline of his joke, of a joke that, uh, reference Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger. I was just watching the latest special. The fact that that is gonna, that his comedy is gonna be consumed and watched by, I don't know what percentage of Americans, but it could be as much as 10%. And they're gonna get a, a joke about Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger. I think that shows that we're kind of entering into the collective consciousness of people. But, I think people need to like pump the brakes if, if they think that it's because we're, you know, our militancy or our anger has done anything. It's just been 
the internet and it's just been the availability of products. So, I mean, we're a small cog in the wheel of all that. We just need to keep greasing the wheels to kind of make people more open to this stuff. And that kind of feeds into my why I think maybe militancy is counterproductive and that anything that's going to hold people back in any way from eating plant-based is a roadblock to progress, you know? Mm. And so the people that are going to protest against Impossible Burger because uh, some mice were hurt and not thinking, not keeping the big picture of that now, as, at least in America, in every Burger King, you can get a, a vegan burger. I mean, that's huge. So when someone says, hey, you're vegan, ha ha, what do you eat? Well, if you go to Burger King, you get a, a vegan burger with fries because Burger King, unlike McDonald's here, doesn't use uh, beef fat in their fries. That seems a lot more relatable to people. They're like, oh, you eat burgers too at Burger King? Like, that's normal. That normalizes veganism to people that might not normally, you know, think of veganism as an option. So they're like, oh, hold on a second. So one, you know, I go to Burger King occasionally. If I, instead of getting their whatever Whopper, I can get this, this other Whopper. Uh, easy. No, I think what you, you touched on is really important and it's something that could be a series in itself because I don't know if anyone's ever done the math of what makes more of an impact. But also, when in your specific example that you use, when we're storming you know, restaurants and we've got like the meat is murder, we've got, you know, you are a murderer for eating this thing. It, it is very aggressive, but what I would ask someone who is of that mentality at the moment and we're not trying to vilify those people because if we haven't already said at start we understand we really do yeah. is is what is your most ideal outcome for that are you expecting you to yell meat is murder at this person eating a chicken burger and then all of a sudden them drop the burger you know what you're right i'm going vegan from this day ah. forward to that it's like that seems like a very far-fetched fantasy to me and this might be quite confronting for a lot of people and I might get slack for saying this but using that approach seems like it's more about you than the animals it seems like it's more about with that group uh direction action everywhere their main thing is to make uh make being an activist I guess sexy or fun or whatever so mm. Their ba I think their bigger thing is getting people to watch them. It, I mean, how much of that helps the animals? You know, I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, perfect, nor do I know everything. So I don't know everything. And some, some people, you know, they're at, they're through their activism, they might be doing, you know, they might be able to reach a bunch of people. I don't know. However, I agree with you. In the, in the putting all the energy and the time and the money it took to get to a, a restaurant or a supermarket, going in there and yelling at people, uh, the probable outcome of that is just that you felt you feel better and you let all that anger out at somebody. Uh, did you create a vegan? I would guess not. And I mean, I might argue that maybe our approach should be less about creating vegans and more about creating more people who are going to eat plant-based. Like mm. it's a very different approach. It's a very different a desired outcome, but it, if, if our goal is saving animals, then more people who are eating more plant-based products is going to mean less animal-based products are being sold, which is going to mean supply and demand-wise, less animals are being killed. And therefore, even though it might not be as fulfilling or as sexy to, you know, to go about that as a goal, uh, that might be more practical and actually have more benefit to the, to everybody, to the world, to the animals. And, and that's, that's kind of a paradigm shift in thinking that we might want to consider as a whole as as a movement in that uh and i've i've often uh brought this up to groups like uh, anonymous for the voiceless they have you know educational videos that show a lot of suffering animals and slaughterhouse and stuff and dairy okay uh yes you've opened some eyes but they don't there's no follow-up on the 
okay, why don't you just eat a, eat a plant-based burger, eat, you know, drink some almond milk instead. Here's all these great things that you could, you know, the eater vegan. Instead, they just leave it at that. They're just trying to make people feel bad about the, the stuff that they're inadvertently doing, which, you know, again, I, I get it. Uh, but I don't think, uh, from my perspective that that's as helpful, you know, I could be wrong, but that's, that's just, you know, seeing the long game. That's my opinion. I mean, I'm going to play devil's advocate to your point. And I, I, you know, I'm not even going to play devil's advocate. I'm going to, when I was doing anonymous, the voiceless at the very beginning of my, my vegan journey, I, um, I, I did actually, we, there's this brand, I'm not sure if they're in the US, but they're in Australia called Vegan Easy. And they made these booklets of like vegan recipes, um, vegan bodybuilders, vegan athletes, vegan doctors, like, and different like quotes and actually had the recipes at the back. And what we would do is after having that conversation of like, you know, have you seen this before? How does it make you feel? We would always hand that pamphlet kind of like you with Peter back in the day but instead of it being about the animal or whatever it was about for you it had these recipes so I think maybe when we mix that approach with genuine information about recipes and you're right there needs to be the action step so for those talking to people and just saying here are all the problems but I'm not going to give you any solutions that in itself is a problem hmm yeah, I think I, I mean I would agree with that. That that's it's really not uh it's really not helping anything. Yeah. It's it's more about uh me talking at you at that point than me talking with you. And you know, and and I agree it's not really it doesn't it just leaves it right there, at, you know. And the the first PETA pamphlets I got I got didn't give me any ideas about how to eat, which is probably why I ate, you know, shitty food for so many years. So I, you know, I was like, oh, what do I do? I, I kind of had to, I learned to cook and later went to culinary school part, partly because I needed to learn how to cook because there wasn't like I had any other options. You know, it was like, uh, it was a survival thing, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, look, Bill, let's, let's come towards the end of the show here. Um, there's a few things I want to just finish up with. It's been an absolute pleasure to Thank have you. you on. And I want to end the episode with a bit of words of wisdom from you. So it could be anything about what we talked about. It could be anything about what you've been thinking about for the last one to 49 years. I think <laughs> mm. the, the platform is all yours to speak your mind. Thank you. Well, I think my role in this whole thing of, uh, of veganism right now is about helping to set up the next generation of activists to really spread veganism and plant-based eating to where it we're, we're now maybe at, I don't know what percent, but I, I heard as much as three to five or something. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the next generation can bring it to 20 or 30. So oh, that's really what I, I feel the whole point of me in this, in this thing is, is to hopefully uh, open as many minds as I can, you know, uh, being able to kind of help people see how normal it is and to normalize this way of living. And that's about it. It's kind of like, you know, be ready to pass the, uh, pass the ball to the next generation of, of activists who are really going to do awesome things, I think. And, uh, yeah. Um, well, I guess what else should I say? <laughs> well, you finished perfectly on like a ball of hope really, because there's a lot of hopelessness out there. There really is. And I, I love the fact that you were finishing on hope. Well, thank you. Yeah. I don't, I really don't understand why people are going to concentrate only on the negative and and we had talked about you know different approaches if it, it's not so much that i i want to make someone feel bad for eating dead animals i want to make someone feel good for eating plants and for choosing something mm. that's good for the planet and good for the environment and good for animals and good for your health i and i think really What's helped me with this is being an RN and having to talk to people about, you know, their health and, and healthy lifestyle and healthy living. 
It's that I've seen that when you just confront somebody with negative, their ears close off to it, they got, they get guarded. But you're like, hey, whether it's uh, cutting down on someone's drinking, you know, drug use, or eating uh, really awful food that's that's literally killing them, trying to, you know, praise someone for the positive when they do it, say like, well, you can make better choices next time for the when they when there's something negative and leaving it at that because they people will beat themselves up about something uh, enough, so you don't they don't really need at the end of the day us to go in there and you know, beat them up for us, you know, uh, so always concentrating on the positive. It's, we were talking about ways to sell this, you know, and almost like a sales pitch, Hey, the positive is going to work better. And, uh, and as ridiculous as it might seem to people, you know, those super sexy photos of clickbaity vegan food prepared just right with, attractive uh women and men like saying hey like this is my plant-based whatever i think that does a lot for the movement because people are like oh hey i could eat that that looks delicious i want to look like that person or date that person hey that looks normal oh this is normal this is mainstream versus what we used to do which is just uh, uh, f you like you know mm. eat vegan or or else uh it, it wasn't helpful it wasn't positive the message wasn't on there. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I think the future is bright. The future is awesome for this movement. And I'm just happy to be one small part of it in making the world a better place. I love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experiences and your story. I definitely find it really awesome to have have you in, in the movement considering you've been a vegan for coming up to 30 years. And that's incredibly um, you know, it's inspiring really. And my thank you for coming on this episode ext extends beyond that. And it's thanking you as a human for being out there and actually talking to, you know, you're going around the country prior to COVID and post COVID, I'm assuming you'll resume, you know, talking about this movement. And in, in this conversation, we talked a lot about animals and animal ethics and there's nothing more inspiring and productive than saving these animals lives and that's something you really work towards and it's something you don't have to do no one has to do that but you really put yourself out that out there to make that difference so you know as a human as a podcast host and as a vegan i thank you for doing all that for, for us my generation and the future generations and of course for all the animals the voiceless those who cannot thank you I will try to embody that as a medium to thank you for them. So thank you so much for all of that. And thank you again, Bill, for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom. Well, thank you very much and stay vegan strong, everyone. Hi there. Welcome to the end of the episode. How did that conversation land for you? I, I incredibly enjoyed my conversation with Bill. He's a top, top bloke. Um, I hope you learned a little bit around the femininity and masculinity of what is a lifestyle cho choice and how potentially following our ethics doesn't mean you have to endow yourself with a, with a label like being feminine or masculine. It is simply an ethical and moral choice that should guide your decision-making process. And I love that about Bill. I love his confidence. So this episode was incredibly fun to have. And if you enjoyed, you can follow Bill and everything he's doing. I'll leave the link in the show notes. And I think that is all for me today. If you want to follow along, hit that follow, subscribe on wherever you're listening or watching this, whether it's YouTube or Spotify or Apple. Follow along the journey so you are notified of every new episode. And I promise you, there is some amazing conversations to come. With that being said, until next week's episode, Stay happy, eat plants, peace.